I don't think we're trying to use, you know, tech for tech's sake ever. Mm -hmm. um, again, it really goes back to, you know, tech is a tool to achieve an experience goal. Um, and that technology, you know, digital technology happens to be our toolkit, but we're never technology first. So when I think about AI, I think the same thing applies. It's really mm -hmm. how do these, you know, this set of tools allow us to tell stories in a new way that's interesting to us. Welcome to Barriers to Entry, the podcast where every episode we get into it with the leaders, the designers, the early adopters, and the influencers who are driving innovation in the architecture and design industry. It's the metaverse, it's AI, it's blockchain, and it is all happening here. I'm Tessa Bain, and as always, I'm joined by my illustrious co-hosts, Andrew Lane and Bobby Bonet. I feel like illustrious is your go-to adjective, isn't it? Have I not said that before? I just think that in life, in general, you okay. just... Okay, I thought you were you know? calling me out like I've used that on the pod already. No, I think you just love that word and I love being called it, so I don't know. <laughs> Bobby, are you feeling illustrious? I am I would bet a dollar that Tessa's used that before. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> have I actually? We might need to go into the archives. We'll have to check someone, in with the production team on this. Yeah, but it seems, seems like it might be likely. So I think. But that, we have an archives uh, now. This is year two, year two glow up. Here we I go. I know, right? We're totally glowing up. Episode 26, year two, summer of BT, long in the rear view. And super exciting guest today that, Bobby, you were not able to join us for quite a bit of. I, I don't know if we can summon Rob Schulte, producer Rob Schulte, to talk about what happened there. But maybe you want to give a summary for your absence to the viewers. I'll just say very quickly, we remote produced Barriers to Entry about 80% of the time. This was a remote produced episode. And my mesh network at home failed me. So mm -hmm. I was on for the first uh, two minutes. And then I disappeared uh, due to an internet failure. But here we are. And uh, I'm excited for our Halloween episode today. Uh, the Halloween theme ends right now, but uh, we're going to get into it with Sarah okay. DeLeo from Gensler. She's leading up the DXD program at De Gensler and learn a lot about storytelling led design today, which is a conversation I was really excited to listen back to. And I know our listeners are going to enjoy as well. And maybe you'll even surprise the listeners with a, a little guest appearance towards the end, Bobby. Let's see. We'll see. We'll see. Cool. Let's get into it. Today on the pod, we're excited to welcome a true storyteller who's now using her experience as a filmmaker and virtual reality producer to redefine experiences at one of the world's largest design firms while passionately advocating for inclusivity in all she does. Today, she is the co-studio director of Gensler's Global Digital Experience Design Group, leading cross-functional professionals to create leading edge experiences for the firm's top global clients. And to put a cherry on top, she might be the first ever guest on Barry Century to have two distinctions. She is both a distinguished member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, as well as a licensed pilot. Please welcome to the pod a woman of many talents, Sarah DeLeo. Welcome, Sarah. Lovely welcome. to be here. Thanks for having me. Lovely. So, Sarah, you work in the world of design today, but you came to your role at Gensler through a pretty non-traditional path. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of storytelling in your work and how your career before Gensler prepared you for what you do today? Sure. I think that I've had a very multidisciplinary and maybe circuitous path to where I am and what I'm doing now. But when I look at everything that I've done, like the through line for me is always that I've spent my career as a storyteller. I began very early, you know, really in, in childhood, even as an analog photographer and a creative writer and eventually you know, grew into a filmmaker. I went to film school and that was my formal training. And I ultimately became a producer producing stories across a variety of media and platforms from cinema to advertising to experiential installations and virtual and augmented reality, and now working in the built environment with a focus on immersive mm -hmm. experience. I'm relentlessly curious, and I love learning new things and solving hard problems in new ways. And most of all, I love finding a way to tell a compelling story and uh, make people feel something. Sarah, your, your group, the Digital Experience Design Group, is something that's really integrated across all the work at, at Gensler. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how something that's that cross-functional comes into being in such a large and, and disciplinary, interdisciplinary group? And I know this predates you even a little bit, but maybe you can take us back in the lore a little bit of how this came to happen. Absolutely. Gensler is obviously a highly respected global architecture and design firm and has been around for many, many years, has an incredible legacy. 
And over its 50 plus years of history, the firm has always grown by expanding its capabilities and services across many industries. It started actually as an interiors firm and then grew into architecture and over time started providing more strategic services and research and brand, now sustainability consulting. And DXD or digital experience design is one of many of those newer services and capabilities that uh, like all of the others that have been added over time are really driven by where the industry is going, where we see the world going generally, and you know, ultimately what our clients expect from an integrated design firm. So when you're so think, thinking about like where DXD is going, like what are you thinking about to keep up with that? You know, you say it so casually, we're just where the world's going, but obviously <laughs> that's something that's tricky to put your finger on the pulse of. I think it's very meaningful that DXD grew up organically within Gensler and isn't a uh, you know, separate team or a separate capability that was gained through acquisition, um, mm-hmm. as it is for some other companies. You know, we really grew organically out of a team doing brand expression, brand storytelling, and eventually as the world trended in an immersive and digital direction, a lot of that expression, they found, you know, having immersive and digital components, there's a lot of complexity and specialization obviously needed to execute that work. And ultimately this predates me, you know, but they wisely decided it's kind of a business unto itself and brought in leadership to run that business, which is still here today, running the business successfully but still working very closely hand in hand with the brand and strategy partners inside the firm. And I think we work with those folks every day and really wouldn't be able to do what we do uh, without those relationships either. So we have this incredible advantage of being part of this very large firm with established capabilities in all of these other areas that are also essential components of instilling a you know successful digital activation in the built environment. We've also had the opportunity since we were grown up organically within Gensler to scale along with the needs and desires of our clients. So as we've had this wonderful growth trajectory over the past several years of DXD's existence, that's gone in tandem with the scale, the volume of both our client base and kind of the ambitions and size of projects that our clients are undertaking. Yeah. We've actually like started this a little bit of an informal poll. You've, and you've been... Ch- we'd love to get your thoughts. What do you think about the word fidgetal, number one? <laughs> what is your opinion on that? And then how does the concept of fidgetal play into your work? I'm very curious to see your poll results (laughs) and if anyone has voted yes on digital, I'm curious. But in these trying times, it's the one thing we can agree on. Mm -hmm. Everyone hates the word digital. I think it might be my least favorite portmanteau of all time, though it has some some good competitors. But it certainly, you know, obviously it calls out the essentialness of connecting physical and digital design, right? And that there's plenty of great digital design in the world that's not connected to physical space, but that's not what we do here. You know, that that's not the um, the purpose of Gensler and DXT. We're here to really create unique experiences at the intersection of architecture, interior design, brand, and technology. And leveraging technology to activate and connect spaces and engage audiences, even going beyond the time that they spend within that built environment, that's the key to, uh, I think, the success of of what we're able to do. So the connection between physical and digital, I think what we're always aiming for in our design is that that connection point feels seamless and not like a separate layer or a separate channel of an experience for a person. You know, we don't want a piece of content or an element of digital design to pull you out of the environment barring, you know, maybe something where maybe that's being done for a very intentional reason. But for the most part, we're really looking to design in a completely integrated fashion. And we, that's part of the, again, the advantage of being part of Gensler is working so closely with interior design teams, with brand Mm -hmm. teams, with strategy teams, so that all of those design decisions are being made in an integrated way and not to overuse that word, but that we're driving towards the same uh, client goals and design goals together and creating spaces that are multi-sensory and deliver on that physical digital design experience without the person having that experience being aware of that separation. So functionally, you talked about all the people you're collaborating with. Like, How does that work? How is it 
that you get brought into these different experiences or these different projects, I should say. How does that actually structurally work inside the firm so that you get to give the input at the right time and in the right context? I think that a big part of achieving what you're talking about, which is what comes before the integrated design process begins, Mm -hmm. right? How do we actually tee up that process to happen and to unfold in the most successful way? I think this is not an original sentiment, but it, it really starts with relationships and trust. I think that we've been very fortunate to have some incredible collaborators uh, within Gensler who are leaders in their fields and, you know, subject matter experts in their fields that we've been able to partner with and build trust over time um, that not only will we deliver something that ultimately, you know, meets the client's needs and makes the client happy, but that we can come at it from a like-minded point of view that we can collaborate on design solutions that take both the physical needs of the space and the digital goals into account. And, you know, that we can do that collectively with excellence. I have a long history of being part of new ventures inside of larger organizations. You know, it's my sort of entrepreneurial side and... Entrepreneurial, I think, is the portmanteau you're searching for there. Oh, nicely done. All right. (laughs) I like that. I'm so accustomed to being in roles like that at this point that I really enjoy what I would kind of call the process of winning hearts and minds. You know, that really happens brick by brick. And so I think it requires a lot of patience, also coupled with the helpful impatience of being really ambitious and, and being bold and having big goals without losing sight of, you know, the ways that you need to build relationships and trust to be able to achieve those. And I think that's true on the client side too. You know, I mean, I I actually really enjoy client, like working in client relations, which I've done in, in many of my roles and I enjoy solving challenges. And I think any constraints that come from clients, whether they're logistical or budgetary or time or uh, any of the above that Constraints, you know, for the most part, really do encourage you to just think more creatively and most of the time really appreciate that. So I enjoy that process, too, of, you know, clients are just people, right? Mm -hmm. We all, and ostensibly, we all have the same goal and we all, uh, they have a lot of knowledge about their brand or their company or their need that that we don't have as, as intrinsically. And we have knowledge about what we do that they don't have as intrinsically. So we have so much to share with each other. And the process of building trust through sharing that expertise and, you know, using it to make one and one equal three is something that is really fun for me. How well, you, I was curious, you, you talked you, about uh, constraints, but can you talk a little bit about what some of these constraints are that, that you might face and like, what are some of these things that you collectively need to overcome? Yeah. I mean, I think with any work in this industry or anything similar, budget and time is almost always a constraint, right? There's never an infinite budget, never infinite time. So it's just a sliding scale of of how strong that constraint Mm -hmm. is, but it's always there. I'm, you know, it's good, fast, cheap, and you pick two, right? You're lucky if you get two, but I began my career in independent film and of the many gifts, I think that formative experience gave me that still serves me today is the willingness to dig in and figure it out. <laughs> There's a time period when you're producing a film independently where you're the you're kind of the first person there for a while while you're out there trying to kind of galvanize people to be your collaborators and to come on board this kind of crazy train with you and while you're out there raising money and before the machine really spins up in earnest. And the same thing kind of happens at the end when the machine spins down and mm. you know, you're sort of the last person standing and keep getting, you know, statements from a distributor years later or hearing, you know, some issue that comes up um, way after the fact. But I think the great thing about that is it's forced me to wear a lot of proverbial hats and I'm still comfortable doing that. It also it gave me the experience early on of the existential level necessity of being curious and learning about other people's expertise and understanding what other people do well enough to be conversant Mm -hmm. with them Mm -hmm. about it. Because part of the job of a producer is really to synthesize all of that information and, and, you know, use it to 
make a plan and move forward. So you must have uh, to be really collaborative too with a lot of the manufacturers, fabricators and things like that. Like I'm sure you're learning about all new technologies and materials coming <laughs> out and yeah. like that must be a really interesting part of your job because you probably are on the like the forefront of you know, new materials that are doing something different that a lot of people haven't heard of? You know, I think we have a couple of creative technology directors in our practice who are truly incredible, as well as, you know, a number of other creative technologists that support them, all of whom are, are really incredible. We have technology production team that is also amazing at what they do. And collectively, they have very close relationships with you know, AV integrators, manufacturers, and fabricators that ultimately are hired by clients, but are work, we work very closely with to achieve these experiences. And, and absolutely, those relationships are crucial to you know, everything from being able to understand hardware lead times to helping to spec out something to do something with this transparent OLED that right. you know, we haven't seen done before. We have a lab in New York and a lab in LA where we do a lot of prototyping and testing that is really crucial to our practice as well. And you know, we're lucky to be able to sometimes borrow or utilize those materials to mock things up and test things out. Yeah, I'm curious too, like that's a lot on like physical and built environment. And you know, we talk a lot about metaverse on this show and wondering, you know, if you can speak to let's rewind maybe like a year and a half ago when like the metaverse hype was a thing. What were the asks you were getting from your clients then? How has that transitioned into the spaces that you're building today? Like, are you seeing a shift in the type of request you're getting from clients from a year, year and a half, two years ago to today? It's very interesting. I mean, I think that there has been some interesting work done in the metaverse space from an architectural and design standpoint. It's obviously very nascent. I don't know that I felt it touching our work that much. I do think that someone I, who you interviewed, I think it was Patty Carpenter, which mm-hmm. was maybe of all of you guys have had so many great interviews. She might have been my favorite. It was just an, an incredible. Nice shout um, out for Patty. Love that. I was going to say shout out Patty. Yeah, <laughs> she, she was just amazing. I mean, I also really like the other standout to me was maybe David Schwartz just because we're mm. in such similar industries. And so it was fascinating to me to hear from him on the kind of challenges and opportunities that I'm very familiar with and I'm kind of thinking about every day. And she's kind of the opposite. She's in this field that I don't really know anything about. So hearing from her was really just, it's, it was so edifying to hear about how she works, how she looks at trends and color and textiles and all of this. And I just also, just as a quick tangent, like loved when she was talking about how she can tell the difference between clothing that's been designed completely by human hand versus using CAD Mm -hmm. tools or, you know, other computer programs, because I am a big, you know, analog photography nerd. And I I still really hold on to film with that same Mm. belief that I can see the difference. (laughs) Yeah. So totally. Yeah. I I think it was just an important point she was making overall about it's reflecting where we are culturally that people are drawn to things that you can tell are handmade in some fashion, right? That, mm-hmm. that somehow um, it's been imprinted. Um, maybe that's a decent segue to thinking about kind of what is the future of the metaverse. I thought of her because I feel like she expressed more bullishness about the future of the metaverse than many people do right now. But I kind of think that, and I'll preface this by saying this is not my area of expertise. So you can, you know, sort of discount whatever whatever I have to say on this, but I feel like the version of the metaverse that people have ultimately rejected is the version that's like completely separate from our day-to-day reality. Yeah. And it felt analogous to me kind of to the hurdles that I saw in the VR space back when I was producing a lot of VR storytelling, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, that even with very compelling worlds to explore, there's a very high barrier to entry to convince people to, to choose an experience that effectively cuts you off from your social framework. And I've heard it described as the only experience that is fully active, active with the exception of being on a roller coaster. Like when you're on a roller coaster, the only thing that you're doing is being on a roller coaster. Exactly. But like when you're doing something like listening to our podcast, you're probably vacuuming, driving your car, like doing any number of other things that would allow you to be right. simultaneously productive in another pursuit. Yes. But you put those goggles on and you get the virtual fishing rod out as Tessa knows 
you're going to be, uh, it's a bit of a callback, Sarah. Tess is an expert metaverse yeah. fisherwoman. He's no, amazing. Please, <laughs> But you end up in this, that. like to your point, closed off space. And Greg Lindsay, a few guests ago, was speaking about products and technologies that he sees as being designed to sort of direct reactions to the pandemic where it's like, okay, we're all locked away now and we can't see each other. So it's cool if we put these goggles on and don't need to interact with anyone else because we're not allowed to anyways. And that we're still sort of seeing a hangover from that in the technology that's now kind of starting to roll out. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it felt like a long time, obviously, but in the scheme of things was a pr pretty ephemeral moment. And mm -hmm. if anything, people are now sort of like, desperately hungry for more communal experience. I see value in virtual worlds beyond the entertainment factor in their ability to really foster agency and that kind of sense of inclusivity in their communities because of that ability to co-create and to kind of create these new emergent narratives and really that in you know Minecraft, Roblox, whatever, like mm -hmm. people really are effectively building these worlds themselves. And I feel like that's the most sort of compelling or evocative aspect of virtual worlds in my mind. It's not, you know, the brief novelty of people like going to the metaverse bar to have a meta drink with meta <laughs> friends. The meta which, cocktail. Yeah. Never, yeah, never you know, tasted like, so sweet. Right. But it's easy to see why. For most people, they're never going to do that. And even early adopters, I, mean, I think the novelty of that probably wears off. But for worlds that have the ability to evolve, just as our world does, and for worlds that allow their users the ability to, you know, at least kind of navigate, much less to kind of co-create what they are, that feels like it has huge potential. Yeah, and those spaces that course, are purpose-built too, right? Like the things that, that your team is building aren't necessarily metaverses, but they're, you know, encroachments of digital into a physical world that serve a purpose that create a moment that tell a story. Like I think that that, you know, we talked about in the pre-call is like small M metaverse is just this idea of these more immersive experiences that are creeping into our physical world all the time. And even when you see the way Apple has kind of reacted to everything that Meta has been doing, you start mm -hmm. to see that immediately is it's really about the confluence of the two. And here we are back at Fidgetal. <laughs> yeah. Well, y you know, we could go back to maybe just calling this shared experience. Like, mm. I think that a lot of what we're starting to see emerge as really popular, like even, I don't know, think about kind of the the popularity of the Taylor Swift at tour, like mm -hmm. part of that insane popularity in my mind, maybe this is because I'm not a Swifty, but like, I think it can be. You're not allowed to admit that. that. You, you can't say that. It's not. <laughs> if you just repeat after me, I am a Swifty, I bet you yeah. will get like literally, thousands and thousands more listens. <laughs> literally, half the NFL uh, have come out to be Swifties now. I don't think it's impossible. It's impossible to not be one now. I know. I feel a little left out. All right. Well, when we end this, I'm going to go do a, a long listen of Taylor Swift songs. Like, you're, <laughs> like I think that was, was that Bobby's daughter. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'm going to give a, a Alexa command and hear them all. Maybe I'll turn into one by the end of the day. But, you know, just saying, even for those of us who may not be tapping into, you know, being a fan, I feel like that the, the popularity of that tour to me is somewhat explained by people's clear desire to share their love for something with other people who love it too. And, you know, I think we used to, a lot of people used to find that in the movie theater and that has obviously been waning for a long time. But I think this does underscore, this is like really where I'm very bullish, is the importance of unique real-time experiences that are shared with other people, you know, communal experience. You know, if we look at TV, for instance, you know, TV is way better than it was 30 years ago. I think most people would probably say that. But it's also much harder to find community around the shows that you watch. You know, it's like every one of us at a party is people telling you like, oh, you should really watch this show. And it's like everyone has a show they want to recommend to you because there's thousands of shows and nobody can watch all these shows. And it's not like, you know, when everybody galvanized around watching the finale of Seinfeld or something. And so there's people I think are seeking that kind of communal, like sharing of the love for something in other places. And, you know, look at Sphere, like, Look at Meow Wolf. Look at Disney World as an easy example. Ultimately, there's a need that people have to share that 
um, even with strangers. So yeah, when absolutely. you're creating these shared experiences and these types of spaces, I know one of the things you've mentioned before is you're incredibly passionate about creating inclusive and immersive design. Can you share a little bit more about that? What does that mean to you specifically? Sure. Yeah. Obviously, as I've just been kind of banging on about, you know, I feel like communal experiences are really impactful in physical spaces and in virtual spaces. And I think it's safe to say that our team of you know, designers and technologists and strategists and producers and project managers, that we're all striving to create engaging immersive experiences. And we're, and we're doing that with this internal mandate to design for inclusivity and certainly for accessibility. But sometimes I think that can translate to democratizing access, which is also very important. What I'm really interested in is extending that beyond into authentically inviting in a diversity of users and really look at experience design from this mission of building inclusive communities. And I think that that really kind of unlocks the, the deeper power of what immersive experiences can achieve. I think inclusivity is obviously a, a term that has myriad implicit meetings. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, without kind of going down the rabbit hole of that, I just say when we talk about inclusivity in the context of immersive experience, we're contending with a wide array of considerations from physical abilities and geographic locations, technological proficiency, gatekeepers, access, identity. There's all these different matrices for inclusion. And I think we believe and we found through our research that navigating those considerations with sensitivity and intention is really key to achieving successful engagement and building a diverse audience. Obviously, there's a lot of different use cases. You know, we create experiences that are open to the public and we create experiences that are closed. You know, they're within um, a workplace, for instance. So I have been lucky to be part of a, a team that's been a recipient of a couple of grants from the Gensler Research Institute, which is just an amazing feature that, that Gensler has of a, a really incredible research institute doing amazing breadth of research across topics and, and sectors. And two colleagues of mine who i happy to credit, I don't know. Since yeah, you can totally not, name drop. Bonnie, we encourage it. My colleague, Nick Hubbard, who is a wonderful content strategy lead, and my former colleague, Bonnie Reese, who's a wonderful strategy director, we teamed up and we did two years of research on this topic, initially looking at factors that drive inclusivity in digital content in public spaces, and then kicking a slightly more narrowing the lens to engagement strategies that support immersion, um, you know, that, that support successful immersive experiences. Uh, I think one key observation that emerged from the, the first round of research was the importance of people having influence over a communal experience and how strongly that translates to a sense of inclusion and belonging. Right. So I spoke about that a bit earlier. You know, I think in immersive experiences in, in the built environment, this, you know, this has different considerations than it may in you know, virtual environments like, you know, RPGs, like you know, Minecraft, Roblox, you know, whatever, where it's a little more kind of straightforward how people you know, build those worlds together. But we, you know, we build kind of responsive and interactive components into a, a great number of our experiences and thinking about how we engage people in being part of the experience and how we can ensure that um, everyone feels like the experience is for them mm -hmm. um, has been a, a big priority. I think a great example of this in our actual work that I could talk about is the interactive content wall we created for the Dell Technology Club at the Moody Center, a sports arena in Austin. Yeah, and, and you shared with us some some content about this, right? We'll we'll make sure to post those articles as well <clears throat> as part of the show notes. Um, great. Yeah, I think it's you know we without going into great detail, you know, this is a sixty foot long LED covered in you know in a architectural design material that gives it a really interesting look. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't come, it doesn't um, present as a screen per se. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's kind of going back to what I was saying before, that the notion is that this is blending into the design of the space, 
and becoming another design feature of the space. But we have tracking cameras, sensors that are part of the installation that allow in different modes the generative imagery on the LED to respond to the movement of people who are passing by. And there's all these different modes that can be flipped for concerts versus sports. You know, there's branding for the um, UT team that plays there. You know, there's there's different ways to engage with different communities and different use cases. But the very basic element of it is you influence the outcome just simply by moving your body, simply by being there. Um, and it's so crowd pleasing, you know, people love it. It also has very low barrier to entry, which I think is, you know, is kind of an important piece of that too. It's kind of how we got the name for our podcast, right? I love it. I I think I've used that phrase a few times now. It's just, you you, you picked a good one. Rolls Um, off the tongue. It rolls off the tongue. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom picked for you, more scheduling flexibility, and at a more affordable price. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash BTE. That's betterhelp.com slash BTE. We also wanted to check in with you. I know you brought this up as a point that you can't go too deep into, but you've been doing some work in AI and design and storytelling. And we'd love to just hear a little bit about how, obviously, this fast emerging tech, and Tess already alluded to that, you know, and you alluded to the labs that you have that are testing things all the time, but kind of where are you at with AI and what have you been learning and how does that fit into this process that you've been, you know, laying out through the conversation so far? Bold in the ideation, but, but thoughtful in the application. I think our team is really great about that. You know, we work with enough emerging technology that while we're excited about emerging tech always, you know, right? Like if anybody from Apple's listening wants to send us a Vision Pro to play with, that, that, that's awesome. But I think what's often more compelling, and if I look at our body of work, what I think I could point to in almost everything that we've done is to use existing tools in non-standard or surprising ways. And even, you know, the project I just mentioned where we took 60-foot nice LED screen and and covered it with this metal grate to create this totally different experience for the person looking at it, that's not a typical use, you know, for an expensive LED screen. But there is a lot of that type of work in what we do where we're really, I don't think we're trying to use, you know, tech for tech's sake ever. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, it really goes back to, you know, tech is a tool to achieve an experience goal. Um, And that technology, you know, digital technology happens to be our toolkit, but we're never technology first. So when I think about AI, I think the same thing applies. It's really Mm -hmm. how do these, you know, this set of tools allow us to tell stories in a new way that's interesting to us, not necessarily that we're telling a story that's about AI. So I think we are playing with it and and obviously experimenting with what it can do and all of the different tools that are out there right now. We are lucky to be working on a really exciting, really cool project that I unfortunately can't say too much about. But This happens to um, us every week. Don't worry. (laughs) where it is a a really, it's a fundamental part of the system that we've designed, but, you know, it's a tool being used by a designer rather than function unto itself. And I think we're utilizing it in this very interesting, almost kind of poetic way where we take the somewhat, you know, kind of dreamlike interpretive quality that the AI image generation tools seem to have Mm -hmm. and, we lean into it 
and play with that. And then we build other tools around it in a robust system that allow for the necessary levels of predictability and content moderation and design QC and so forth. But That's... generally speaking, I think with any creative team, there's a ton of excitement around you know a new tool that can potentially enable us to express ourselves in new ways, but not that the tail is wagging the dog, you know, more that we, yeah. if anything, the experimentation we've done has really proven out to me and to our team, I think, just how essential the skilled human designer is to getting anything usable at scale out of the tools as they exist today. So I've got one last thing before we, we let you go here. You've talked a lot about different roles, you know, creative technologists, content planners, designers, you know, all sorts of different types of talent that are at the table when you're building out some of these creations. What are some of the things that you're doing as the co-head of the studio to engage such a diverse group of talent? And how do you feel like you've set things up to allow these people to be at their best and to continue to explore and, and grow? I think we're doing a few core things that, um, set our team up for success. We we organize around disciplines, not around you know, geography or seniority or or you know, we have project teams obviously, but our our core organizational principle is around disciplines of of strategy, of design, of technology, of delivery, you know, sort of encompassing production, project management. All of our folks within those are, are subject matter experts, of course, and and bring you know the necessary rigor to building these experiences for permanent built environments. And you know our CTs, creative technologists, really keep us rooted in what we can actually physically achieve, what we can make happen from an interaction standpoint, and and otherwise through our custom software development and our designers who work very closely with the architectural and interior designers to create experiences, as I've mentioned, are fundamentally integrated with the with the space um, and the purpose. I think we have a global approach to staffing our teams. So the reason I think that's important beyond efficiency is the kind of folks we really want on our team have endlessly curious minds, you know, mm -hmm. are always thinking of new ideas. I think they really tend to value getting to work on a diverse slate of projects and to work you know, for a diverse slate of clients and, and even purposes, uh, forms and functions. And because we staff folks globally and because, you know, people get to move from project to project and to work with a real diversity, you know, we have, I think, around 65 people across four major cities in the U.S. and plus London, plus a couple of cities in Asia that people really get the exposure to a diverse set of points of view. They get to work on a diverse set of projects. And I think that is something that people really value, not to mention it ultimately makes all of us better at our jobs, the challenges that are implicit with that and the ways that you learn. Also, the Gensler Research Institute, I think that that is a big part of this kind of culture of design innovation and desire to really put structure around our thinking. You know, even when we feel like we're doing something successfully, it's not really enough to just do it well. We want to understand what did we do well? How did we do it well? And, you know, continue taking this, this really rigorous approach to looking at ourselves and individually and collectively and being kind of on a, a permanent path of improvement. It's amazing. Uh -huh. All right, everyone. And through the magic of audio, we've actually been able to locate and have Bobby rejoin us because if you wouldn't know it, it's time for some plugs. And I know Sarah's got a few cool things to talk about. We would not want to tee this up without having Bobby here to join us. Welcome back. That's Bobby. the thing. If you say the word plugs three times and click your heels, <laughs> I appear. Mm. <laughs> Sarah and I got a chance to catch up over the weekend in between when Andrew and Tessa interviewed Sarah and today. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit, Sarah, about what you and DXD are focused on as it relates to the experience economy for the plug section and anything else that you've got going on with you and the Gensler team. Absolutely. Yeah. Indeed, my plug really is for the experience economy as a whole. I think, you know, immersive experience to me is the most exciting form of storytelling happening in the world right now. And beyond even what we're already seeing, I think this field is poised for exponential growth. 
we've talked a lot in our conversation here about how digital immersive are permeating the physical spaces where we live, mm-hmm. work, and play. And what I'm seeing across our clients at Gensler is that they're really tuning in to the unparalleled impact and importance of experience, be it for their customers, employees, clients, visitors, patients, et cetera, and looking to bring particularly digitally driven immersive experience touch points into their built environments. I think alongside that, we're seeing placemaking becoming a high priority across lifestyle sector and beyond. And for DXD, for our digital experience design group at Gensler, that's been really incredible news because as we're seeing this evolution happen across a wide array of sectors, we find that our work is applicable to pretty much all of them. And we're designing and building immersive experiences across workplace, mixed use, retail, cultural institutions and museums, aviation, hospitality, healthcare, et cetera. And We've also developed an expertise and kind of specialization in this expanding sector of experience centers or innovation mm-hmm. centers, which a lot of our workplace clients are creating and dedicating to these curated user journeys for either select groups of employees or clients or both. Just don't call it metaverse, right? <laughs> well, it is sort of like the lowercase m metaverse that we've talked about together, right? And yeah. actually, a, lo- a good number of those experience centers or innovation center spaces that we've worked on do include digital twins as well. Mm-hmm. They're being used in really interesting ways, maybe for more kind of qualitative purposes than we may typically think about digital twins. But yeah, there is a lowercase m kind of metaverse aspect to this that that's quite interesting. And the other trend that we see within all of that is the need for spaces to, you know, be multimodal, you know, to be more than one thing to more than one community, whether that's an innovation center or even certain communal spaces within workplaces. And of course, diversification of how space is used in retail and hospitality. You know, another way that I think about our approach being flexible and nimble, again, across these sectors, but it's kind of a different matrix to look at is scale. You know, we often are working at building scale, obviously, but we just as easily work at district scale. I think one of the most incredible projects I've gotten to be involved with here is for the AT&T Discovery District in Dallas. Gensler completely uh, redesigned this mixed-use campus uh, for AT&T and turned it into, you know, not only an amazing lobby in their workplace that has this beautiful, immersive media environment, but a, an incredible public space that has, I think, foot traffic of around 50,000 people a week and, you know, F&B and retail and with a, a 100 foot by 80 foot, sorry, I don't know how to translate that into meters for <laughs> For the Canadians on, but um, a very large media Everyone wall. has their own AI that can figure that out. Yeah, exactly. Now, so. uh, we'll do it in real time, but a very large media wall that, that wraps the building and where DXD got to really lean into, you know, building a full kind of run of show entertainment experience and program work from some of the world's best media artists. And, you know, we also even sometimes work at city scale. We write digital master plans for entire new cities being built from the ground up. So... Um, it's interesting to hear about work like that because obviously the sphere has been such a sp- such a hot media topic of conversation <laughs> in Las Vegas. But I mean, you know, you did that for a campus as a part of a project that you know obviously wouldn't get the sort of wide scale consumer acknowledgement or, or awareness of it. But it's it's just interesting to understand how much of this work is really progressing from so many different channels all the time. So obviously, another vote for experience economy just in that. It's so true. And I think while a lot of our work to date within DXD has had perhaps you know slightly different purpose than something like the Spear in Vegas, I think the really exciting development that Gensler has made over the past year, and it's particularly exciting for us in DXD, is pushing into the entertainment space. And you know, themed entertainment is obviously, you know, has always been focused on creating these kind of unique and sticky experiences and usually at a significant scale and is seeing explosive growth. We all probably saw that news that Disney is, well, maybe facing some challenges on their content library and film and TV side is doubling down on their theme park development investment. And you know, Universal is making major moves in this space as well. They recently hired our brilliant former colleague, Molly Murphy, as their new president of Universal Creative. For Great shout out to Molly. Yeah. And experiences. Molly is amazing and already doing incredible things there. So you know, and obviously you referenced the sphere, which is 
you know, I know a lot of people involved with and is unprecedented in so many ways for all of its its technology, but also its reach, right? And and how many people it can flow through and the level of exposure that it creates for this type of immersive experience. And I think pushing innovation forward in that way is beneficial to the entire industry. And the public response to that space, to me, just continues to inspire confidence that people are really hungry for these experiences, these, you know, I think I said earlier, like unique real-time experiences. And Gensler recently brought in Bob Weiss, who is one of the you know, foremost experts in the themed entertainment field. He led Disney Imagineering for many years and has been groundbreaking in this field for decades. And he was brought in to create and lead our new entertainment division. And I think he has the incredible insights of someone who's not only seen the industry up close over time, but he's actually had a, a key role in shaping its trajectory. And he speaks so incisively about the necessity of putting story first, certainly not, not technology first, not process first, and not even kind of the the designer's idea first, right? It's looking at what will give people an experience they'll remember and letting that guide all the other decisions. So the form and the function have to follow the fulfillment and ultimately with the goal of making sure that the people who experience this work, that they feel that the story belongs to them. That's probably a part of why I connect so strongly to that sentiment is it's really the basic tenet of my own passion for inclusivity and engagement in immersive design. I think immersive design is an incredible conduit to creating inclusivity and you know creating engaging and inclusive spaces. And when we give people the opportunity to take ownership of a space, they will grow it, they'll evolve it themselves. The Yayu Kusama obliteration room from many years ago, I think is always a great example of this. I'm a big fan of her work, but you know it's interesting when you just say people stood in line in New York at least outside Every, um, everywhere. Everywhere, Everywhere, right? It's it's been all over. Hours and hours and hours just to pass through for a moment and leave a tiny colored sticker in the exhibit. So it's just reflective to me of this basic human desire to interact with and have impact on our environment along with other people, right? The communal aspect being really important. And we want to leave our mark. Great experience design invites everyone in to do that, however, you know, tangibly or intangibly it may be within the particular space. And so whether we're talking about a workplace lobby, an airport lounge, an innovation center, a retail store, all spaces that our team gets to touch with our design thinking, ultimately when we're successful, I think the constituents of that space feel that it belongs to them. I love the tie back to live events experiences. I was just thinking about, you mentioned my daughter and Taylor Swift in the interview. I was thinking back to the mass hysteria around Taylor Swift live experiences over the summer. I mean, we're really seeing a thirst for folks having those shared experiences in many different ways. And and thinking about the ways in which technology can augment those experiences is certainly top of mind right now. So well plugged, like you said, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, we love ending every pod uh, by giving our guests a chance uh, to answer our, our standard funnel question, which is always, do you have a piece of advice for our audience or some resources that you would share for someone who's looking to learn more um, or just coming across something like DXD for the first time? My primary advice to anyone who's interested in this field is that there are an infinite number of ways in. The amazing thing about nascent forms of storytelling, which for all of the achievements in digital experience design already, it is still, I think, in an exciting way in its early years. But the amazing thing about that is forms of storytelling that are emerging are really open to innovation before like a quote unquote establishment exists. And I think this is held true you know, through history. I come from films, so cinema is kind of my lens and, and my bias. But I think about the way that cinema was made great over and over again through kind of reinvention by people who weren't part of the existing power structure. So you know, whether that's in the 70s, in this like heyday of cinema with the auteurs who didn't come out of the studio system and really completely turn filmmaking on its head. And then again in the 90s with the explosion of independent film, creating an alternative to the studio system. And of course, not my milieu, but particularly, but like Vine, early YouTube, and then of mm-hmm. course, you know, all the other forms of social storytelling that ultimately like you know, accumulated in TikTok. That whole rubric of storytelling on those platforms was built by those creators that just sprang up in their bedrooms doing something totally different from what else was out there. I think in my own career, I was you know, kind of on the front lines of VR filmmaking when that was 
in the zeitgeist. And I was lucky to, to get that firsthand experience and really see how that medium was kind of transformed into some degree created by people who came from other areas of expertise that had relevance in sometimes surprising ways like theater and gaming and museums. And that was part of what made it great. So I look at our team at DXD, there is this diversity of backgrounds and diversity of experiences that not only are embraced and I actually think are are part of what is our secret sauce that makes our team so gifted and so effective. People come from, you know, anything is as disparate from exhibition design to modern dance, to painting, to people like me who come from film or advertising, and people who who really have taken a a straighter path through architecture and interior design that, and of course, you know, all of our software and development team who have very different backgrounds. So it just sort of illustrates the point perfectly that there are myriad access points to this work. And, you know, I know, again, just to say I'm part of you know, a team of of 60 plus people at DXD. I'm part of a large leadership team that drives the business creatively and business-wise that everybody on our team is incredible and is driving the success of this work for Gitzler. So I think we need the unexpected people to keep making this work as amazing as it can be. And we probably need people doing things that we don't even know exist yet. So if that's you, give us a call. It's amazing. I think we always appreciate any chance we can get to learn about the secret sauce. So we definitely appreciate that sharing. And thanks so much for for spending this time with us, Sarah, for regrouping with Bobby to make sure that we really nailed the plug section, which yes, is obviously important. a part that's near and dear to his heart. But yeah, we can't thank you enough for coming on with us. And, and Bobby, I know you missed some of the conversation, but I think you got a great flavor of it there at the end, just in terms of some of the sharing that we had with Sarah and some of the great stuff that we had learned. I can't thank you enough for encouraging me. You, you all were the catalyst in my never having listened to a Taylor Swift song to now having listened to one Taylor Swift song. I know when I was listening back to the interview, Andrew did the wise thing of making sure, Sarah, that you amended the record to qualify that you're a big or an emerging Taylor Swift fan, mm-hmm. which was important. This is it. Another thing, by the way, I learned yeah. is that Andrew prefers listening to podcasts while vacuuming, which was new to me. But uh, actually, by the my way, truly preferred, my truly preferred, if we're on the record, is while yes. grocery shopping. And Tess was just about to correct you. I know, right? Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen Andrew vacuum. He does a lot, though, but vacuuming is not one of the things he does. I have to say, though, that exciting to listen to an interview like this in that I think with such a, a focus on storytelling, this is the type of conversation that resonates or will resonate with anyone, irrespective of whether you're in the design industry or somebody who's just a fan of forward thinking and innovative and cutting edge design. And it's apparent, uh, I think there was a moment in the interview, Sarah, where you were discussing early pandemic approaches to metaverse and virtualized design. And the way I took that was we were designing kind of backwards a little bit. And clearly what you're doing and what DXD and Gensler is doing is you're designing forwards with that storytelling forward approach. And that's encouraging. And again, very accessible to listen to, I think, for anybody who's a fan of storytelling in general. So it it was nice to be able to listen to this looking back. And even though I had some FOMO missing out on the interview myself. Thank you. I love to hear the passion for storytelling reflected back. I think for me, that's always my greatest motivator. And I think the central nugget of what we can give people really make someone stay better, make their customer experience better, their patient experience better, their workplace experience better, just by the power of story. Well, I'll thank you again, Sarah, for joining us. Love to thank at this time is everyone on the Barriers to Entry production team, in particular our producers, Wise Grisette and Rob Schulte, who had a big stand-in opportunity on this particular recording. And of course, everyone back at the studio by Sandow in the pod cave, pushing the buttons and the knobs and making it all sound great for us. Just a reminder to everyone that Barriers to Entry is a part of the Surround Podcast Network. So please make sure that you go to Surround Podcast, that's podcast with an S, dot com, Smash the follow button, follow along for all sorts of great new conversations coming up as we now move into our second year of Barriers to Entry. And and please be back next time as we continue to break down those Barriers to Entry. Did we trick them with the time lapse already, Bobby? 